I'm David Griffin, it's the 16th of September 2018, I'm here at Derbyshire County Cricket Club and I'm talking to Steve Goldsmith. Steve, this is like one of your longer innings, we're now into the third <laughs> phase of it. There are uh, many of them. Of that interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we'd reached the end of 88 really, we talked about your, your first season at Derbyshire, a good one, you got a thousand runs, you got to a Lord's final. Um, how did your career? How did you see your career progressing from then? Because obviously you, you saw yourself, presumably, as an established member of the side by that point. Yeah, to a certain degree. I mean, you were never um, in my position a hundred percent, but yes, I did. I saw myself as a you know established member of the twelve, thirteen players that were going to um, you know hopefully progress and win things in the future. That's what we were looking for, and an eighty-eight and the final particularly sort of get gave us that a uh, little bit, bit more impetus that yeah we can achieve this we, we've got there we've done that yes we didn't win it but we were there so why not let's go on and win something else um, unfortunately from my point of view I then proceeded or started to get injuries um, so I had knee injuries and knee problems and it kept knocking me out for sort of three months of a season two, two to three months of a season so I started to struggle with a few injuries, but um, yeah, there was an opportunity there for as a as a team uh, to go and win things. And there were new players coming in as well who were contributing hugely. Yeah. The overseas, obviously, um, you know, and Adrian K for people like that, but also Chris Adams and Tim O'Gorman, these guys coming up through the ranks, and Chris being a local guy, um, you know, were making huge influences. Looking at the um, the changes that you just described, your first season here was. John Wright's final season. Um, your second season here was Michael Holding's final season. And then, of course, Ian Bishop, and yeah. you've already mentioned Adrian Caper came along. And by that time, Dominic Cole, Chris Adams, Tim O'Gorman. So the side had a probably stronger, slightly stronger look to it, a younger, a younger look to Young, it. Definitely a, bit, a little bit younger. Yeah. As the older ones, older players were going out, the, there were young players coming in and younger overseas players coming in. Um, and yes, the side, side was developing all the time. Um, and had huge potential and was proving that. And you were bowling at that time as well, weren't you? Because we talked originally about the fact that you'd started life as a batsman. Uh, I'm not sure who that was, but uh, <laughs> uh, these things happen in these uh, interviews. Yeah. Um, but you said you started life as a batsman, of course, developed um, into an all rounder, really, didn't you? Yeah, I, as I say, I was an off spinner in, back in as a junior player, um, but I. Up here, when we went in the nets, I used to bun it, run in and bowl in the nets and used to bowl little away swingers. Mm. And because I swung it, um, that, that was always a bonus. So in the championship games, you get to 70 overs and there'd be 30 till the new ball comes mm. and the big guns could come back on and they'd throw you the ball and say, right, Kim would say, oh, I want 15 overs from that end from you just to see the old ball out and get the new ball in. And then there was one particular game here um, probably in 1990 and somebody got injured in the middle of a Sunday league game and I was looking around that somebody's got to fulfill their split it was like four overs somebody's gonna to have to bowl at the death here and I'm looking around the ground and thinking there isn't anybody else here I've got the job and I started at that, at that point I think it was a B and H game I think yeah. um, and I came on and I swung a few and although we lost the game I ended up bowling the last over as well um, and funny enough, that day it reverse swung in the last over, which we didn't nobody had, had a clue about. Um, but it did reverse swing. I reverse swung it, and I didn't. I still to this day don't know how I did it or why it did it, but it did swing like that. Um, but yeah, it, that's how it started. A little bit of swing bowling in the nets. Um, Kim had some faith in me bowling reasonably straight, and so it developed and ended up with a little bit of split bowling on Sundays as well. And it was the Sunday League that um, brought Derbyshire's first trophy for nine years and it was probably the culmination of what you talked about in one of your early interviews, the, the 81 side had won the Nat West but then it broke up mm. and then basically Phil Russell and Kim Barnett created a side bringing people like yourself, Peter Bowler, Alan Warner from other counties and by 1990 we'd also got those local players as well plus a crackerjack overseas player. Yeah. So was the, I mean you played I think 12 or 13 of the 16 games, so you were pretty much a, a regular in the, I was in, the Sunday yeah, league. Yeah, so. I didn't think it was that many during that, that yeah, season. 12 uh, or 13. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I came in quite, quite a lot in the six 
spot as usual. Yep. Um, I can remember batting, I would have been pre that batting with Michael Holding at the Oval in a Sunday league game. I think it was a tied game, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, that was my role coming in there to, to sort of be the middle order, but also to hit the ball around. Yeah. Um, there was a game up here that was televised that I think maybe Worcester and um, Jeff Boycott was commentating on the telly and he, he commented that me and Chris would never be able to hit the ball straight because of our techniques and the next ball I hit for six down the ground into the grandstand and, uh, and he, he took it all back straight away on, on live on air. You know, there was, there was games that were um, vital to the fact that we were going to be up there and competing and there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that number one, um, Adrian Caper won that that lead for us that year, his batting was outrageously phenomenal. He hit balls in places he shouldn't be able to hit the ball. Um, and on the back of that, Chris Adams picked stuff up and started playing the same shots um, and was obviously watching and studying how he played certain shots. And he'd pick a ball up from outside off stump and hit it over deep square. And I remember Chris doing that and putting it in the car park behind the pavilion. Um, but that side developed during the season and I was a little bit in and out um, because I think Tim O'Gorman was around then and there were various others coming in. It was, it was, it was a great sign. It had a little bit of depth in it. We weren't reliant upon 11 players and then um, a load of guys who couldn't play from the seconds possibly who weren't good enough to come into first team cricket. We had a genuine squad of players um, that were going to compete. Did it surprise you, looking back, that Caper only ever came to England for that one summer? Yeah. Never, never played for any other county, never came back to Derbyshire. Why, that, why we didn't bring him back, I don't know. And uh, Maybe there was a reason for it, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but as a, as a player, he was, he was... Ahead of his time, would you say? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. There were, you know, there's always one or two in, in every county you look at in those days you, you feared. Um, and he was obviously our one. And what was great was... People like Chris, myself and others were probably picking up stuff off him um, at the time. So we were developing from him leading us, if you like. Um, but I do think that you know, he was ahead of his time. If you look at the modern game um, and the way it's played, T20 cricket, etc., I mean, he would have been absolutely phenomenal in T20. Oh, um, <laughs> many, easily, many, many times over. I could, I could see him. I saw him out in South Africa, I think, the following winter. Um, and he hit the England Rebel team um, for one of the fastest hundreds. It was a 44 hundreds. ball 100 or yeah, something. Yeah, it was, it was it, crackers yeah. and it went everywhere. But of course it wasn't recognised, it wasn't yeah. you know, even considered a first class game. But he was hitting pe people who could play. I mean, it was John Embry and people like this yeah. were out there. And he smashed them all around the place. And that was, it was not a 20 over game either. Well, well I remember the 1998 year was held in January. And um, someone asked of Chris Middleton, the chairman, who's this Kuiper bloke? And he said, well, I'm reliably informed that he is the South African Botham. Oh. And there was general scoffing from <laughs> most people who never heard of him. And of course, six months later, this man is, yeah. became a legend, really, of, of Derbyshire. Yeah, and he, he no did things with the ball as well, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, if, I think a lot of people forget that his bowling, um, oh, it might not have been Botham-esque in, mm. in pace, certainly, but he bowled uh, balls on a spot and he had a plan all the time. And in that sense, the game was probably... In ahead of his time, yeah. um, but as a genuine all-rounder, yeah, he, he probably was. Who would have influenced him in South Africa? Who was working with him then to, to turn him into the player he was, or was it just an instinctive kind I of thing? I think probably a bit of both. Um, there was probably maybe Bob Warmer involved around that sort of time. Mm. Um, who knows? It's we just never really tell. saw anybody like that until the T20 era. No. That I can think of. No. Him. I would say they were probably, destructive players, yes. but not of the kind of the, the, the sort of. It's hard to explain. He almost De Villiers twenty years before De Villiers yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. That sort of player. Yeah, and I mean you can imagine him probably in, on his apple farm because he was an apple farmer, yeah. as I remember. Um, you know, just throwing apples up, <laughs> smashing them, and practicing that way. You know, no nothing else yeah. to do. It worked, and and what he did, he had an incredible eye. Very very strong man. You know. Um, farmer type, very solidly built, but incredible strong wrists as well. And as I say, he manipulated the ball to places that you just think, how how could he do that? The only other one I've seen do that was Azradin. Yeah. You know, and, and, but it was a, a different type of player. You know, throwing and, and wrist, yeah, very wristy sort of player. 
um, whereas Coates was more sort of muscle in it, yeah. but uh, he made it work within his style. Um, yeah, exciting to watch as well. So that wonderful summer of 1990 that you were a part of, we get to the morning of the 26th of August 1990 in Derbyshire on the verge of winning a trophy. Having never won a trophy at Derby, mm. because of course the 36 <coughs> title, they're in Somerset, and in 81 they're at Lords. So what was the build up to that game like? Because of course it was in the middle of a championship match. Yeah, it was in the middle of the championship game against Essex. Mm. And Essex were, I think, top of the championship um, I think won the title. Won the title that year. So they had, they firstly they had a very strong side in the championship side, and I think they were very protective of that. So they they didn't put out quite such a strong side on the Sunday league game against us. Um, and when coming into the ground, it was just the amount of people in here. I don't think we'd ever seen anything like that. I, I don't know what the numbers were. There's all sorts well, of numbers. Well, they say 11,000. I've they say 11. never seen anything like it before, and yeah. certainly haven't since. I, 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 thought, I heard eight on the day, yeah. but I think there was a few sneaked in, possibly yeah. another 3,000. <laughs> um, the place was absolutely rammed. I mean, and compared to today, where the ground is actually a lot smaller and t closer in, um, it was a lot more open in those days, and um, there, was, there wasn't a space anywhere. Um, and particularly when we ran off, having, having won the game, um, you just swamped. I think they were on the field probably before the ball even got to the boundary. Um, I think Do you remember much off. about the game as a whole? Not as a whole. I remember um, certain players playing for, for them. I know Mark Arlott bowled the last over. and um, I remember saying good luck to him on, as he bowled the, the first ball of that particular over. Um, and he just smiled at me. And um, I think Steve Andrews was playing in it as well, who hadn't played a game all season, I think. Um, and Chris was back playing, and I was just running up and down. I, mean, I, I ran some twos and threes, and we were like lightning between the wickets, which most people who know me, um, especially over in Norfolk direction, would say that that's not, not the Steve Goldsmith they know, running between the wickets quickly. But I was quite quick. Mm. Um, and I legged it for twos and threes to get him on strike. And I think I faced my first ball and got a one or something. And then I didn't face a ball for two overs. And I was in with like four to go, I think it was. So I hardly faced a ball um, until facing the, the, the last one to get the runs. And um, Chris just smashed it all around the place and got us into that position. Um, and I just kept getting, getting him back on strike. And so what was it like, that stuff. ball? Because we, we talked to Jeff Miller and Colin Tunnicliffe that when they won the final at Lords in 1981, it was a leg by. Mm. <laughs> Although Thomas <laughs> tries to claim he got a nick on it. Um, in '93, when we won at Lords, we bowled second. So, yeah. so what was it actually yeah. like? You are unique in that you you were at the crease and hit the winning run. What what was I it never like? Never thought of it like You're that. The only person that's done it in yeah. a final. So, or in a, you know, to win a trophy. Yeah. What was it like? Did you feel any pressure on you, or did you just? Do you know, I didn't. How did, how did you play the game? In that they respect? bought the field in, obviously, because we only needed, I think, one to win. Mm. So they brought the field in. I think there were three balls to go, maybe four. Yeah. It was the fourth. It was either the third or fourth ball of the over. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. I just thought I'm going to hit it, and I'm I'm not going to mess around here. I'm not going to try and plod it around, plod it for a single, and you know risk getting run out. I'm just going to hit the thing. And lucky for me, Mark Isle bowled it sort of in the slot on leg stump, and I just picked it up over mid wicket and somewhere soon, over there, somewhere over there, there yes, yeah. um, towards the T bar. And, and I don't um, think it reached the boundary before. Oh no, the crowd were on it. On yeah, I think I've seen a photograph. I think it's one of yours um, of me hitting it, yeah. and I think you can already see people on the field yeah. as the ball's going over the top of the fielder's head at mid wicket. So, so where was it? So, presume you ran to Grizzly. First, yes, did yeah, you I think so. Before anybody else yeah, did? I think so. Um, and then I just all I remember is a swarm of people, and then being carried off on, <laughs> but a, a whole, you know, it's like um, what do they call it, crowd surfing. Yeah. I was lifted up on somebody's shoulders, and then everyone's trying to grab your kit off you, and you're <laughs> hanging on for dear life to your kit, um, and and being basically carried most of the way to the pavilion um, until somebody I think managed to get us down, and we got in there, but it was just. Uh, euphoric stuff it was great and the reward of course was um, this is not the original trophy this is a replica yes uh, but um, there we go the that's trophy, the Refugee Assurance yeah. League 1990 trophy the first time you've seen it probably since yes it is the first time I've seen it since then um, yeah it was, it was a bigger one than that obviously yeah. but um, 
I remember Kim getting that up on the balcony. I think Chris Adams was there, yeah. Jack Warner, yeah. um, Stan Morrison. Well, and and I was John Morris had back. come back from his yeah. test match. Yes. Well, John had made his test yes. debut and there was yeah. a rest day in the test, so yes. he came back. So all the photos have got him in kind yeah. of civilian in his clothes. Suit. Yeah, 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 in his suit and tie. Yeah, it was um, yeah, up on the balcony and uh, the presentation. I was, I think I was out the back slightly. I certainly wasn't in any of those photographs, um, and probably shirtless by that that stage because I'd done a swap with a supporter. And I can't, I'd never remember who really? he was or what his name was. But he had the most hideous purple flowered shirt on, and this guy was a big lad. And, and you swapped it, and I swapped it for my county shirt. He was desperate to get some memento, yeah. so I gave him my county shirt, and I ended up wearing this thing most of the night. It got torn to shreds, stank of champagne and beer, and that. I think it went in the bin shortly afterwards. But it was bright purple with flowers all over it. It was hideous and about four or five sizes too big for me because he was a big lad. Yeah, um, yeah so I got... And a good man to buy all of Oh, see. definitely, yes. In, in the pavilion or a written down? I think we were in the pavilion most yeah. of the night. Yeah, I think we stayed in. It was a long time in the changing room because it took all winter for them to clean the changing room. <laughs> um, you know, and even when we came back the following year, there were still marks on the ceiling of drops of champagne that had mm. sprayed everywhere because it had gone all over the place. Um, yeah, it was quite quite an evening, quite an evening. Looking back now, I mean, Derbyshire have only won one major trophy <coughs> since then, 93 Bansons, did get promoted in 2012, but you must presumably have a sense of pride and great achievement that you were a, a significant part of a, a, a great win for, for this county. Yeah, um, and to a certain degree a little disappointed um, in that, that side got a little bit broken up um, around sort of 92, 93 um, and 94, maybe just beyond there, it got a little bit broken up and it, it had so much potential and maybe didn't make the potential, you know, use that potential and go on to mm. fulfil it. Um, so a little disappointed in that. Disappointed in myself that, you know, I had injuries and I had problems which resulted in me going in that direction. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed every second of it, um, and I wouldn't change any of it. There's an era now where you know it's all in bed by half past eight and healthy eating and all this sort of stuff. That wasn't our era. That wasn't the way we played our cricket at the time. Um, with a bit more guidance, maybe we might have even done a bit more um, on the field positively. But um, no, I had my injuries, and I ended up coming away in nine, after 92, um, having enjoyed every second of it. You know, disappointed with the injuries and, and so on, but enjoyed the, the cricket, enjoyed the com company, and still in touch with so many of the guys now. I mean, I bumped into Jack Warner, spoke to him not that long ago, uh, about a year or so ago. Pete Bowler, I'm talking to all the time because we're doing a little bit of business. Um, John Morris, uh, John, well, I've met John a couple of times, and Chris I talked to on um, social media. So you keep in touch with a few mm. of the guys as over the years, which is really good, you know. and they're old mates. And I even bumped into Tim O'Gorman the other week you know, in his hierarchy, looking very posh. Mm. Well, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you. You will forever be remembered as the man who hit the winning runs to win a trophy for Derbyshire. And it's been an absolute pleasure to hear your own account of your cricketing life. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, thank you.